stories to tell because she's done the work, she's done the research. And I'm looking forward to hearing from her as you are too. Let's please welcome and stand to your feet the department chair at Harvard University of the Victor Thomas Pro uh, Professor of History and of African and African American Studies, the incredible Dr. Evelyn Higginbotham.
blessing to be here today and thank you you are an amazing choir I want to express my appreciation to the Reverend Dr. Kevin Cosby for the invitation to speak to you at this 2019 summit of the Baptist Women's Educational Convention I want to thank you Reverend Cosby for your leadership of St. Stephen Baptist Church and for, the, and for the wonderful achievements of Simmons College under your presidency. I also want to thank Sherry Mills, who has worked very hard to make my visit possible and so very comfortable. As a historian of the Black Baptist Church, I am deeply honored to stand before you today. And if I may digress just a bit, I come to you not only as a historian of black church women and of African Americans broadly, I come also as the national president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, known by its acronym ASALA, A-S-A-L-H. We are the founders of Black History Month. The Association for the Study of African American Life and History was founded in 1915 thus 104 years ago, by the historian Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the man we know today as the father of black history. He received his undergraduate degree from Berea College, so he has a tie to Kentucky. He graduated in 1903 in the school's last racially integrated class before the Kentucky legislature passed a law that next year prohibiting the integration of black and white students. Berea sued the Kentucky, the, the, the state, and took its case all the way to the Supreme Court, but it lost the battle in those years of Jim Crow injustice. Now, as president of Asala, I must tell you that we have branches throughout the United States and that a branch is being currently formed right here in Louisville. Barbara, thank you. Barbara Boyd and others in the audience today are actively involved in organizing a branch in this city. I invite anyone who loves African American history to join Asala and become a member of the chartered branch. You'll be a charter member of the Louisville branch. It is more than a privilege for me to be here in Louisville. In many ways, it is an especially unique moment for me to stand before you and speak on the subject, Forgotten Voices, the timeless message of the pioneering women of the Baptist Women's Educational Convention and their message for black America today. And I am struck by the truly unique quality of today's occasion because of my book, Righteous Discontent, The Women's Movement in the Black Baptist Church, 1880 to 1920, which was published 25 years ago and is still being read today. And in that book, I write about your conventions, your conventions, pioneering women, the passage of more than 130 years has caused many of the names to be forgotten. Thus, I made it my goal to bring to the readers of my book the story of the rich heritage of Kentucky's Black Baptist women. 
and righteous discontent won many prizes and awards and was largely responsible for my being hired as a tenured full professor at Harvard University. When people praise the book, I always respond as I do now by saying, the true praise must go to the church women I wrote about. The many years of research left me so deeply moved by their faith in God and by their tireless efforts toward the advancement of their race, especially the women, that as the hymn goes, I couldn't keep it to myself. I had to tell their story, and in a way that would be acclaimed by both scholars in the academy and persons from all walks of life in the general community. In thinking about their lives, their work, their writings, and their meaning for us today, I decided to choose the biblical text, 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 10 through 12, which reads, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. I want to emphasize the portion of verse 12 that states, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. When they spoke of the things that now have been told you. Today, at this, your educational summit, I must proclaim they were not serving themselves, but you. The Baptist Women's Educational Convention of Kentucky has a proud history. In 1883, 1883, well over 100 years ago, African-American women coming together from Baptist churches throughout Kentucky, formed the first statewide Black Baptist Women's Convention in America. Additionally, your Kentucky Black Sisterhood formed in order to generate financial support for higher education, and specifically for the school then called the State University at Louisville, which was renamed Simmons University in 1918 after its former president, William J. Simmons, and it is today, as you know, called Simmons College under President Kevin Cosby. In reading about the dramatic strides of Simmons under President Cosby, I am reminded of the great progress of the school under the leadership of the Reverend William J. Simmons who was appointed president in 1880 and who served in this role until his untimely death in 1890. Under his presidency, the school witnessed the addition of collegiate programs, increased student enrollment, and had new buildings. But the progress is also explained by the formation of the Baptist Women's Educational Convention in 1883. Although the school was actually founded in, in 1865 under the all-male ministerial-led convention, the General Association of Kentucky, the school had hobbled along financially for nearly two decades. This all changed with William J. Simmons, who did not share the old-fashioned ideas of many of his Baptist brethren that women should not have their own independent statewide organization, Amen. that they should not have direct involvement in the administration of the school, or even attend the minister's meetings to discuss the school, despite the fact that women's societies already existed in many of the individual churches. And the women were eager to create a statewide organization to help 
the men. Simmons, on the other hand, Reverend Simmons, encouraged the formation of the Baptist Women's Educational Convention, and he applauded its emphasis on supporting the school. The record states that the women's first meeting occurred at his church and that he presided over this initial meeting on September 18, 1883. And then he turned the governance completely over to the women to go forward. The founding of your convention inspired black women in other states. You became the role model. In the following year, 1884, the Black Baptist Women of Alabama organized for support of Selma University. Many Black Baptist women's educational conventions came into being in the 1880s and 1890s for the purpose of supporting Black Baptist-owned universities in their respective states. The legacy of the pioneering women of the Baptist Women's Educational Convention of Kentucky reveals the power of history, the power of history in the black freedom struggle. And it does so in three ways. And these ways serve as timeless lessons and constant reminders that your foremothers were not serving themselves, but you. The first lesson is history's, history's power to inform us of otherwise unknown individuals, events, and facts. The historian recovers and records the past so that we might know something of the men and women who left their mark on society. And thus we first see the power of history to inform us, to validate and document the presence of our people in the historical record. I grew up in a household that was devoted to African-American history. My father, who was a secondary school teacher and principal, worked with Carter G. Woodson in the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, as it was called then. And he often repeated the statement, we work to disprove the lie that the Negro has no history or none worthy of respect. And in the waning decades, in the waning decades of the 19th century, for people who were born during slavery, or those in the first generation of freedom, the power of history to inform and document our people's achievements can be seen best in our church records, in our minutes, our organizational proceedings, and the newspapers published by the various denominations. Those sources tell of the role of the black church in the founding of schools for African Americans. Under slavery, laws denied the enslaved the legal right to read or write. The commitment of our people to provide education was then especially important and even more important during the years when black people were losing the promises and the rights that they had under Reconstruction. In many southern cities, in the decades of the 1880s and the 1890s, black students suffered from huge disparities in tax money. You paid the taxes, but the taxes went to white schools. In some places, no public high school existed at all for African Americans. The last two decades of the 19th century and in the early 20th century, segregation laws were passed one after the other. This was the era when the courts sanctioned such racist laws. And they did so in the name of states' rights. The Plessy versus Ferguson decision of the Supreme Court in 1896 upheld the doctrine of separate but equal, and we know nothing was equal. These were the years when southern states brazenly disfranchised black voters. You talk about voter fraud. And we had the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed the right, at least for black men, to vote. No woman could vote. Mob violence and lynching ran rampant. 
called by the historian Rayford Logan, my own professor at Howard. The nadir in race relations meant the lowest point in race relations. And this was this time when the convention was formed. This was a time when Southern states introduced the first racialized mass incarceration by imprisoning black men, women, and children and reaping profits from their labor through the convict lease system. Yet it was in that very time, in fact, in the year 1887, when the incredible William J. Simmons published his book, Men of Mark. In Men of Mark, he introduced the younger generation of readers to great black men of the past and present. His collection of biographical essays included many, many people who had faced what he calls severe trials and yet accomplished great things. Simmons sought to refute, he sought to reject the negative and the demeaning stereotypes that appeared everywhere. Black people were disrespected through these images that appeared on signs and in advertisements and in art and in literature everywhere. And Reverend Simmons sought to prove that amidst the difficulties and the mounting oppression that our people faced, African Americans through their own churches, their schools, their businesses, through their own collective elf efforts of self-help and serving their communities, we could boast a record of achievement and offer evidence that we as a people were rising. Now Simmons dedicated Men of Mark in his words to the women of our race. And in the preface of the book, Simmons acknowledged the power of history to inform and to confirm our people's presence in the history of this nation. This is what he wrote, I quote him, I have noticed in my long experience as a teacher that many of my students were woefully ignorant of the work our great colored men, and they were even ignorant of their names. And I think that's unfortunately true in many places today. Simmons continued, if they knew their names, if they knew their names, it was some indefinable something they had done, but just what they had done, they could not tell. Simmons hoped then that his book would be shared with aspiring young people everywhere so that they might pattern their lives after positive role models and thereby realize the great worth in going to high schools and colleges. Simmons asserted, if the persons herein mentioned could rise to the exalted stations which they have and do now hold, what is there to prevent any young man or woman from achieving greatness? And it was important for him to describe what these men had gone through, the difficulties they faced. He didn't wanna just simply portray these men at the height of their success. And so he wrote, and I quote him again, nearly all came from the loins of slave fathers and were babes of women in bondage and themselves felt the leaden hand of slavery on their own bodies. But whether slaves or not, they suffered. They suffered with their brethren of color. That sum of human villainies, and by that he meant villainies of racism and slavery and poverty. But that sum of human villainies did not crush out the life and manhood of the race. And then he says, I wrote the book to show to the world, to our oppressors and even our friends, that the Negro race is still alive. Now, Simmons' message remains no less relevant today. His words are just as compelling for our youth in the 21st century as they were in the late 19th century. And you know, I often ask my audience, and I ask you to think about this, who are your children's and your grandchildren's heroes? Ask them. This question, ask this question, but don't be surprised if their answers are troubling to you. Simmons, on the other hand, featured excellent historical figures in his book. 
men who are still worthy to be our heroes. And Simmons proclaimed, and I love to quote him, I have faith in my people. I wish to exalt them. I want their lives snatched from obscurity to becoming a household word for conversation. The Baptist Women's Educational Convention was born at this same historical moment. From the vantage point of a century later, I too wanted to snatch them from obscurity and to recover their names and their memories, their words and their deeds for our young men and women today. Because my research reveals your Baptist foremothers and forefathers were visionary leaders. Most of them were only in their 20s and 30s at the time of the founding of the Baptist Women's Educational Convention. Women such as Mary Cook Parrish, she will eventually marry Charles Parrish, who will also become a president at Simmons. But then Mary Cook, Lucy Wilmot Smith, Lavinia Sneed, Mary Stewart, Lizzie Crittenden, Lulu Osborne, Ion Wood, Amanda B. Nelson. These are the names of your foremothers. They were born into slavery or, or born of parents who had been slaves. Some, like Lucy Wilmot Smith, came from single-headed households with only a mother present. Some, like Mary Cook, endured childhoods of financial hardship. Yet they refused to give in to the forces that would oppress and discourage them. And they grew to accomplish great things. And crucial to their success were the male supporters, such as the Reverend William J. Simmons and Reverend Charles H. Parrish. Both men encouraged women's leadership roles in the church and in the denominational bodies at the national levels. Both men were strong advocates of women's higher education and women's rights in the larger society. So their abiding message for us today is for black men and women to respect one another and for black men and women to work together as equals for the advancement of our people. Your history provides heroes and role models, women who navigated the difficulties of life, who persevered and came out victorious. The fact that your convention still lives and thrives to this very day, and that it continues to support Simmons College, affirms the pioneering women of the first generation and the generations to follow and it confirms that they were not serving themselves, but you. The power of history can do more, however, than recover and inform us of the forgotten lives of our local and national leaders. It can do more than fill in gaps and omissions. And this brings me to the second lesson, the power of history to inspire, uh, to inspire us. I felt history's power on a personal level to inspire. As I was researching and reading the published writings, the unpublished letters and organizational proceedings of the Kentucky women, I can recall times when in the midst of reading their words, I found myself literally cheering. On one occasion, I remember a very different emotional response. I was reading a letter by Mary Cook in which she mourned the recent passing of her good friend, Lucy Wilmot Smith. I shrieked, oh no. And then I began to cry right there in the library. Her death at such an, a young age, Lucy Wilmot Smith was only, she hadn't even reached 30 years old, had come as a shock to me, and especially so soon after the death of William J. Simmons that same year, William J. Simmons that same year. It didn't matter to me that all this was happening in 1890 and I was in the year 1990. The pioneers of the Baptist Women's Educational Convention 
were inspiring to me because they spoke in a voice and with concerns that were relevant to my own present day. I wrote Righteous Discontent first as my dissertation. And during years when the field of African American history, women's history, was emerging. I entered graduate school thinking that I knew a lot about African American history. But I soon learned that my knowledge was limited to only men's achievements. I knew very little about the contributions of black women. And in the 1970s, there were relatively few books published on black women in history. This was also true of books published on white women's history. It was rare to see courses on women's history and women's studies in colleges. There was so much new to discover and to learn and to write about. Interest in women's history was growing steadily though. We looked to new sources that had been until then untouched, unexplored, completely unknown. Those sources for me were the Black Baptist church records. And they opened up a world I had never known before. Women historians, myself and others, in the last three decades of the 20th century looked for guidance. We looked for guidance in the lives and experiences of women who lived a century earlier and in what they called in their day, the woman's era. And we found parallels between ourselves and them. They too, expressed excitement about a new and rising woman's consciousness. And they spoke about it in their writings, in their club work, in their church activities. I marveled at the efforts of women who established their own organizations, advocated women's suffrage, pursued women's higher education, and called attention to issues of racism and sexism. The Baptist women 100 years ago inspired me in a huge way. And I was not alone in looking to the past for inspiration, nor is it unusual for us to look to inspiration from familiar figures of the past. Think about Frederick Douglass, or Carter G. Woodson, or Martin Luther King. Great lives are inspirational. Carter Woodson once wrote, those who have no records of what their forebears have accomplished lose the inspiration that comes from the teaching of biography and history. Well, the Baptist women, such as Mary Cook and Lucy Wilmot Smith, these women of Kentucky, but also Virginia Broughton of Tennessee, and by the 20th century, Nanny Helen Burroughs of Washington, DC, they emerged from obscurity and continue to speak to our present. They speak directly to those of us as women who seek employment in previously all male jobs. They speak to those of us as women who seek entrance into all male organizations. The pioneering voices of black Baptist women traversed the decades with messages eerily, eerily similar to our own thus resonating with late, 19th, with late 20th century and 21st century women. And these were women who were filling classrooms of formerly all-male schools or running for political office, like your own councilwoman, Paula McCraney. These are women whose words were quoted on a regular basis by women in religious studies and by women who sought divinity training to be ordained ministers. The women of the 19th century had a message for us as we looked to build our own organizations. And one was in the 1970s, the establishment of the historical organization, the Association of Black Women's Historians. The Baptist women's stories are timeless then because they continue to give us goals to aspire to and the guidance to get there. And this is my third and final lesson, the power of history to transform our lives and the status quo. That power is rooted in our faith in God. For much of our history, African-Americans used the language of the Bible, 
We spoke the language of religion to make sense of, to refute, or to make changes to our present situation. For example, the abolitionist Frederick Douglass relied heavily on the Bible. He did so in his speeches and in his writings. And this can be seen in his critique of the devastating Supreme Court decision in 1857, Dred Scott v. Sanford. Imagine living then and hearing that the highest court in the land had ruled in favor of slave ownership and more than that, as was revealed by the opinion of the Chief Justice Roger Brooktani, who asserted that no African American free or slave was a citizen of the United States, and that Africans were, and I'm quoting Tani, so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. Now you know the Supreme Court has the last word. When it renders its decision, there can be no appeal. Yet Frederick Douglass did indeed appeal to the moral conscience of all who believed in freedom by drawing from themes in the Old Testament that characterize the omnipotence of God. And God is knowledgeable beyond our human understanding. Douglass emboldened his readers to continue the fight against slavery, despite the powerful forces of the United States government. He responded, he responded in a style that appears in the Old Testament books of Job and Isaiah and Jeremiah. This is what he wrote. This is Frederick Douglass's, Douglass's words. And just imagine listening to them after hearing this great defeat in the court. The Supreme Court of the United States is not the only power in this world. It is very great, but the Supreme Court of the Almighty is greater. <laughs> Judge Tani can do many things, but he cannot perform impossibilities. He cannot bail out the ocean, annihilate the firm old earth, or pluck the silvery star of liberty from our northern sky. He may decide and decide again, but he cannot reverse the decision of the Most High. He cannot change the essential nature of things, making evil good and good evil, happily for the whole human family. Their rights have been defined, declared, and decided in a court higher than the Supreme Court. Isn't that amazing? The pioneers of your convention who lived in a world of both racism and sexism also came out of this faith tradition. In the late 19th century, Mary Cook, later Mary Cook Parish, and Lucy Wilmot Smith, both of whom attended Simmons College as students and after their graduation taught there as professors, epitomized, they epitomized the courage to speak out and condemn not only the racism of white America, but sexism in their own community. They rejected the idea of the Negro's place, and they also rejected the idea of the woman's place, because both places connoted a subordinate status. Instead, they urged greater roles for women in the church, in the workforce, in their homes, and at the ballot box as voters. Smith and Cook based their arguments on women in the Bible. In the Old Testament, they identified Huldah, who interpreted the law, and Deborah, who went into battle. In the New Testament, they analyzed pa passages that had been traditionally used and repeated to limit women's roles in church. For example, Paul's dictum in 1 Corinthians that women remain silent in church. And Mary Cook, her exegesis of that text denied that the passage had universal applicability and instead maintained that Paul's words were addressed to a few Grecian and Asiatic women who were, in Cook's words, wholly given up to idolatry and to the fashion of the day. 
And then she went on to argue how Paul couldn't have really meant that because he wouldn't have given all those important documents to Phoebe to take to Sancria and then tell all the men along her way to pay her the greatest respect. Women of impressive intellect, Mary Cook and Lucy Wilmot Smith, enthusiastically turned to the Bible in order to present the theological justification for racial and gender equality. By so doing, they heightened the consciousness of black Baptist women in Kentucky and well beyond. And they helped to mobilize their sisters in the struggle for gender equality. They sought to broaden women's roles, not only in the church, but they did argue against restricting women to a narrow sphere. You know, in many churches, in fact, in some churches at that time, women couldn't even sit with men. Their roles were so narrowly defined that they were either aiding the pastor or in some cases teaching Sunday school. Well, in the 1880s, these Baptist women urged ministers to give women a voice in business meetings and in other church affairs. They were so inspirational and so, you know, they turned the minds of, of other women and, and men around, such that in 1884, Lizzie Crittenden, and she's another familiar name, she was the chair of the Board of Managers of the Kentucky Women's Convention. She was so overjoyed that she stated this, it has really been marvelous how much has been found in the sacred word to encourage us that before had been left unsaid and unheeded. The Kentucky women sensed that they would play a vital role in the work of the Baptist church in the future. Now this would require many changes, but they were ready for it. Mary Cook interpreted their work as a mandate from God, and she wrote in the American Baptist newspaper in a forceful, one could argue, a prophetic voice. This is what she says, God is shaking up the church. He is going to bring it up to something better, and that too greatly through the work of the women. Now, Cook, Smith, and other members of the Baptist Women's Educational Convention called for greater church work. Women of the church, they said, get out into your communities. And I think this is still something for us to think about today. Get involved in social reform. Get involved with youth. Work with kindergarten programs, with hospitals, with orphanages, and prisons. She also recommended that women seek employment as editors of newspapers so that they could develop literature for youth. Her outspoken perspective is best seen in a poem that she wrote in which she challenged young African-American women to dream big and to pursue their dreams. This is a verse from that poem by Mary Cook. Go and toil in any vineyard. Do not fear to do and dare. If you want a feel of labor, you can find it anywhere. Now similarly, Lucy Wilmot Smith wrote and delivered speeches at meetings of black Baptist men and women. And she was only 25 years old in 1886 when she wrote, and I quote her, one of the evils of the day is that from babyhood, girls are taught to look forward to the time when they will be supported by a father, a brother, or somebody else's brother. She was encouraging women to get an education, to get vocational training, to prepare in order to pursue self-employed career options. Reverend William J. Simmons figured significantly in encouraging the women in the Baptist Women's Educational Convention and he acted in an empowering way. He affirmed their right to speak and to act with self-confidence. A minister, a university president, a newspaper publisher, Simmons was all these things. And in all those vocational identities, Simmons created opportunities for women's voices to be heard. He appointed them to significant positions, even in the male-dominated national denomination, denominational bodies. In fact, Simmons is credited with giving the great anti-lynching crusader Ida B. Wells her first start in 
journalism. In closing, history's power to inform us, to inspire us, and to transform us and our society can surely be found in the story of the pioneering women of the Baptist Women's Educational Convention. They embarked upon the journey toward freedom and justice for all, regardless of race and sex. Many, many years ago, and they continued generation after generation after generation to guide us as we continue even today on that same journey for freedom and justice for all. They worked not for themselves but for us by leaving us lessons along our way. They taught us to understand our present through a long view of history. They taught us that to be faithful to our history would require our faith in the future, despite the challenges and obstacles ahead. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Higginbotham. What a message. Jesus uh, asked a question that is perhaps one of the most relevant questions that any of us can ask ourselves. A hemorrhaging woman pushed her way through a crowd to touch Jesus. And after she touched Jesus, Jesus asked this question. Who touched me? And that question is a question that all of us should be asking ourselves. Who touched me? Because the only reason that I am here and you are here is because before you got here, somebody touched you. Somebody made it possible for us to be here. And Dr. Higginbotham gave us some names of outstanding women and men who touched us. That's a good question. Who touched you? Why are you the woman that you are right now, or the man that you are right now? You're not self-made. Somebody touched you. It's a good question. But can I give you an even greater question? And that is not who touched you. But who are you touching? Who are you touching? There's a word that Dr. Higginbotham kept using over and over again, and Betty kind of whispered it in my ear, Betty Baye, who is a journalist, one of the best journalists in America. But let me say this to Betty, that William J. Simmons touched you. The first person to hire women in journalism, period, to give them independence the very first time was William J. Simmons. When they wrote for the American Baptist and a women's magazine that we need to re-resurrect called Our Women and Children. In fact, I sent David, I sent you, it's an old thing. Uh, Our Women and Children, look at Wikipedia, Our Women and Children. 
in which women are talking to young girls in this magazine. It's a historic magazine. And Ida B. Wells wrote in it. And Lucy Wilmot Smith. And so that's when journalism for women started. So that means, Betty, you are a child of William J. Simmons because somebody touched you. And the question is, who are we going to touch? She used the word evil. And it, what has happened to blacks in America is evil. It's evil. Evil. But let me tell you something about that word evil that our foreparents realize. That if you turn the word evil around, it literally reads live. And they decided to reverse evil and respell it. E V I L spelled backwards is live. And we're living because they decided to fight back against evil. And listen, there's still a lot of evil. And this is not about us. I do not want my granddaughter to have to work for Baron Trump. I don't, just listen to his name, Baron. Baron. Mm -mm. I want my granddaughter to be like Lucy Wilmot Smith. So as we stand all over this room, I'm going to open the doors of the church in a unique way as we prepare to go. I'm going to invite someone who wants to serve. and be a new generation of crusaders to make a difference, to come to love God vertically, but serve him horizontally. And then I'm going to invite you, in light of this message, listen carefully, to recommit yourself, hear me, to touching someone else. Amen? And we're going to sing this song, and then we will dismiss, and we're so happy, and I hope the women will come and take a picture uh, with our special guest and as, as well as our judge. Amen. Is there one who will come? Coming to unite with the church. Welcome to St. Stephen Church. God bless your heart. Let's give him some love, amen. Amen. What about the women of the Baptist Women's Educational Convention? And the great president. Amen. And the newest member, Dr. Higginbotham. 
They will be sending you the annual dues. It was a real setup, Dr. Higginbach. I know them. They slick. Oh, my God. They'll send you some dues. God bless your heart. So glad to see all of you here. Uh, moderator, thank you so very much for being here. Amen. Bless you, choirs. Amen. It's been a great day. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, Kevin. Where's Kevin? We have um, um, convocation. Don't forget convocation, St. Stephen Baptist Church, Palm Sunday. Convocation. All right, church wine. Convocation. Also, one last thing, and that is that there will be sponsored by Simmons College a gubernatorial debate. The, the inaugural gubernatorial debate sponsored by Simmons College of Kentucky in which they will come to our community and answer our questions and concerns called Black Votes Matters. It will take place April the 4th, all right, on the campus of Simmons College. Multiple organizations like LCCC, Kevin Fields is here, uh, LCCC, um, Black Lives Matters, and other organizations will come and will convene this forum. This is the first. So uh, come on out, April the 4th, Black Votes matter. All right? Amen. Amen. S Jesus said, and who touched me? And all of us have been what? Touched by somebody else. And because we have been touched by somebody else, then we should go forth and do what? Touch somebody else. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause the Lord's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and lift up the Lord's countenance upon you and give you peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. I'm sorry. Don't forget to sign up for Simmons is me. Thank you.